I'm very pleased to welcome you all to Columbia and especially to welcome our guest speaker, Connie Hedegaard, who is Denmark's Minister of Climate and Energy. Ms. Hedegaard is really at the epicenter of activity today and will be more so through December of this year as the world meets in Copenhagen to uh, discuss what to do uh, and hopefully do more than discuss uh, what to do about uh, climate change at this important conference. The conference in Copenhagen has been described in different ways. Earlier this year, the uh, EU Environment Commissioner Stavros Dimas said of Copenhagen, it's the world's last chance to stop climate change before it passes the point of no return. And then just a few days ago, Stephen Chu, the US Secretary of Energy said, Let's not make Copenhagen the be-all, end-all, and say if it doesn't happen that we're doomed. We can come back in two to four years' time. Now, I think you can all appreciate the title of Ms. Hedegaard's talk, which is Prospects for a Global Climate Treaty in Copenhagen. Will the U.S. join the struggle for the 21st century? Ms. Hedegaard is Denmark's first minister for climate and energy, and she was previously minister for the environment and has worked for a number of years to raise awareness in, in Denmark and Europe and elsewhere on uh, the importance of addressing climate change. Her interest in politics goes back to her student days at the University of Copenhagen. In 1984, she became the youngest ever member of the Danish parliament, elected at the age of 25 as a member of the Conservative Party. And she later embarked on a career in journalism. So I'm gonna warn the people at the back of the room that she She's uh, going to be very uh, uh, comfortable uh, addressing your questions. Um, she um, began in uh, uh, print and radio media and then uh, had a career uh, as a television news presenter before re-entering politics in 2004. Her approach to the climate negotiations was described very nicely by the New York Times on Sunday as tough love. And she was quoted, I hope correctly, <laughs> as saying that her role really was to put pressure on all governments to make the political price of being an obstacle so high that no one will pay it. And so I want to return now to the title of her talk, or the subtitle rather, Will the U.S. Join the Struggle for the 21st Century? I think the U.S. negotiators are going to be in for a rather hard time if they're not cooperative. So I'm very pleased to welcome the minister. Uh, she will speak for about 30 minutes, and then we'll take questions until five minutes before 4 o'clock, and I will uh, moderate the uh, questions and answers. So let us now all welcome Connie Hedegaard. Thank you very much, Scott Barrett, and thank you very much for this opportunity to address you, but also not only to, to say something here, but actually also to get some chance, hopefully, to have an exchange with you. So I'll try to be not too long. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to be at Columbia with such a rich history and with many good people also working within this field. The last time I had the chance to, to be here was only some few months ago with uh, Jeffrey Sachs and his people. And I know a lot of good thinking is going on at, at this spot. But here, as it was just mentioned, I address you as a host of the largest climate conference in history. Now, it's not a purpose in itself that it's going to be as large as possible. Of course, it's because we think that it is a very crucial one, namely the one where the world actually does change the track that we are on right now. I think that this deal is deeply intertwined with strategic leadership in the 21st century. Uh, and I would say that getting a deal on climate the, uh, a climate deal now um, and get it this year. It is not only the most important international negotiation this year, it's probably the most important piece of international negotiation this decade. Unfortunately, it's also the most complex. If any of you have sort of dug into some of the papers, you will know what I'm talking about. It's extremely complex. I had the chance the other day to exchange views on this with Tony Blair and he said, he would say it's even more complicated than the other issues he had been involved in. And I mean, coming from a man who solved sort of the Northern Ireland crisis and is now sort of dealing with the Middle East, it says something about the complexity. 
but what are then the perspectives for U.S. leadership in the 21st century? I just had the chance this morning to listen to your president uh, and his address to the U.N. General Assembly. And uh, it was interesting to me that President Obama, after having, or he sort of said, I have four uh, principal pillars for the 21st century that we should sort of focus on. And he mentioned the non-proliferation of armaments. Then he spoke about the pursuit of peace, Middle East and a lot of other issues. And then he said, but we won't have peace unless we also address the third pillar, which is preservation of our planet. And that is basically also how I see it, that this climate issue is not just about climate. It's not just about global warming. It's not just about energy. Basically, it's a security policy issue, and I'll try to go more into that in just a moment. Uh, but I believe that what is essential right now is how will the United States of America deal with the challenge of climate change. I also noticed that your president today said that the United States would take leadership in the world. I take it it must also sort of count for this field. Few historians would dispute that America was a, if not the, the leading nation of the 20th century. And what constituted this leadership? I would say the three M's. U.S. exerted leadership military, morally, and materially. Militarily, by intervening successfully in the two world wars and prevailing in the Cold War showdown. Morally, by holding high the principles of human rights and individual freedom. And materially, by taking giant innovative leaps, by raising standards of living and building the most productive and prosperous economy on the planet. And by that, sort of getting and gaining respect worldwide. Spreading material gains, helping others out of poverty, that was sort of one of the labels that sort of marked the United States of America. So as I see it, the question now is, will U.S. be able to maintain the leadership in the 21st century? Here we have new rules, we have new challenges. It's not so much as it used to be military conflicts, it's more subtle conflicts in many ways. Just to take the challenge, stemming from the fact that whereas today on planet Earth we are 6.6 .6 billion people, we are supposed to become 9 billion people on planet Earth by 2050. All of those wanting the material goods, a share in the good life, heating and cooling and transportation and mobility and f food and, and, and what have you. I mean, there is a, in, a tremendous demand for commodities, for growth, for exploitation of resources in the years to come. So in that sense, global warming will be a game changer for all three M's because due to, if not also, other facts than the fact that we're becoming so many people on planet Earth, having all these demands and wishes, that would be the defining challenge, I guess. The 20th century military might of the US aimed, one could say, at fighting a foe. Whether it was Nazi Germany, fascist regimes, or the Soviet Union and different communist rules, Highly successful, still superpower, the United States addressed all of these issues. But as I said, the security challenges of the 21st century are going to be very, very different. Even Pentagon has sort of given, given out a lot of reports now acknowledging that sea level rise and extreme weather could topple governments and destabilize entire regions. I recall back in September 2006, participating in the Clinton Global Initiative, when for the first time I heard Wesley Clark, former general, explaining why climate change would be a security challenge for the United States. To be honest with you, at that time I thought, now things must 
sort of turn in the United States because as long as you begin to see it as a security challenge, things normally would get a higher intention, uh, attention. Uh, that was September 2006. Then in October 2006, Nicholas Stern, former chief economist at the World Bank and advisor to the British government, gave out the so-called Stern Report, where he, among other things, highlighted that if we are doing nothing about it, then it's highly likely that by the middle of this century, we're going to have between 150 and 200 million climate refugees in the world. By that, he also sort of underlined the security aspect. So new security challenge will not be foes, but phantoms of underlying resource conflicts spurred, among other things, but spurred by climate change. Meaning that there would be sort of no bad guy or a bad ideology to defeat. This, of course, will require new strategies. We are going to fight causes of conflict rather than the victims of climate change. At least we still have that choice. General Anthony Sinney, former head of the Central Command, has put it this way. We will pay for this, meaning climate change, one way or another. We will pay to reduce greenhouse gas emissions today and we'll have to take an economic hit of some kind. Or we will pay the price later in military terms and that will involve human lives, quote, unquote. Therefore, business as usual is not an option. You could say that the US economy was the motor of the 20th century providing everything from food to fridges at affordable prices. Uh, that was also what helped, for instance, Europe back on its feet after the World War II, the Marshall Aid, Alliance for Progress with Latin America, and lots of initiatives came with that and sort of the US, the US economy was driving uh, prosperity in other parts of the world. But when I said that business as usual is not an option, it's because that if the U.S. is to maintain leadership in the 21st century, then more is required. Dependency on energy from fossil fuels, for instance, will simply undermine the economy. The scramble for remaining fossil fuels will be increasingly fierce. December last year, Mr. Tanaka, who is the Secretary General of the International Energy Agency, put it this way, by 2030, he said, need for production capacity of oil, need for production capacity of another six or Saudi Arabias will be needed to keep up with demand for oil. Think about that. Think about the investments that we'll have to, to make if we just continue business as usual. I believe that's a, a rather hard sell these days. That is also why, of course, energy efficiency comes to the heart of this whole equation. If we don't address this, prices will soar, probably to limits that we cannot sort of comprehend today, and trade deficits will only increase. Also, in the climate area, cost of inaction will rise. Again, according to the Stern report, they calculated that up to 20% of global, global GDP could be the cost of not doing anything. That could be the cost by the middle of this century. They spoke about damage to infrastructure and agricultural production, disasters in coastal regions, and lots of other uh, examples. Hurricane Katharina which we can say was definitely climate change, but we know what it means when natural catastrophe is coming close and how expensive it is to sort of conduct um, cost of inaction. I said that I'm not a scientist, so I'm not going to say that Hurricane Catherine had anything to do with climate change. I don't know if it had or had not, but what is for sure is that science tells us that we can expect incidents like that to occur with much higher frequency due to climate change in the decades to come. This is a lot of problems, and I could go into much more details about that. But 
I just think that what is also very important to stress here is that there are huge opportunities in the low carbon economy. Also their leadership is up for grabs. President Obama has put it this way, the nation that leads the world in creating new sources of clean energy will be the nation that leads the 21st century global economy. I agree 100%. This July, McKinsey uh, published a report, U.S. and energy efficiency, where they said that the U.S. energy efficiency program could cut energy demand by a force, reduce greenhouse gases with almost one-fifth, and yet at the same time save $1,200 billion by 2020. In other words, energy efficiency done in the right manner can also be a factor of competitiveness. Investments in renewables is, as I see it, also to invest in new jobs. Berkeley professor Dan Kamen has said that every, uh, has calculated that every dollar invested in renewables generates three to five times as many jobs as when invested in fossils. I think that there are several studies proving the opportunity for millions of green jobs for many reasons. One of them being that green jobs don't move abroad. I mean, if you install a wind turbine somewhere in Michigan, well, then the maintenance and everything, it stays in, in, in Michigan. And let me there just for a brief moment sort of dwell a bit on the Danish example. Back in the 70s, in my childhood, Denmark was 99% dependent on imported fossil fuels from outside. Primarily, we imported oil from the Middle East and from Saudi Arabia. Then at a certain point, we had a huge energy crisis. There was a political disagreement with Saudi Arabia, and then suddenly we had no oil to import from there. That was sort of the starting point for us trying to do things differently. Actually, it turned so, out so bad that we had half a year where it was prohibited to drive your own private cars on a Sunday. I mean, can you imagine that? But that was just how, how bad it got. Then we started to focus on energy efficiency and on renewables. At that time, we had no renewables. We have no sort of natural resource and no hydro, no nothing. Today, 19% of our total energy consumption, 30% of our electricity, stem from renewables. And the sector of energy efficient solutions and renewables have now turned out to be the most prosperous sector export-wise in Denmark. Even last year, 2008, this horrible year, uh, this sector grew exports by 19%. So I think we can really make the evidence that it benefits your job, it benefits your economy. Even today under this crisis, we have an un un unemployment rate which is just 3 point some percent. Actually, it's also interesting to notice that where did we have the biggest growth in jobs related to this sector? Actually, it was in the rural areas where earlier on they had sort of outsourced textile industries, first to Eastern Europe, later on to Asia. But now today, where they used to have this textile industry, today they are now sort of the hubs for wind energy, wind turbines, pumps, energy efficient radiators, coolers, cooling systems, heating systems, whatever. I'm not going to dwell more on the Danish example, just to say that together with this focus, we also gained totally energy independency, also due to the fact that we explored oil and gas in the North Sea, but today actually we are producing more energy ourselves than we have to use ourselves. To me, there is no discussion that to turn green, that is also the key to future competitiveness. Um, a dominant position in the low carbon economy is a precondition, as I see it, for material leadership in the 21st century. And I understand that the new American administration 
is well on its way. We have the Waxman-Markey bill that is an important step on the way to a U.S. low-carbon economy, and I know that there are many other initiatives on its way. Of course, seen from my perspective, I can only say, get it through the Senate, please. But um, Senate bill this has implications for years' position in the negotiations. We all know that. It means something what the U.S. can come up with on mitigation and adaptation technology and finance, and I'm absolutely sure uh, that the world is now looking for U.S. to deliver on the promise for showing international leadership also in this field. But I must also then warn you a bit, because I think that the time to move is now. The race is on. All good things will not come to those who wait here. I really do believe there is a first mover advantage. And you should, as Americans, be aware that others are having this advantage right now. South Korea is moving, Europe is, China. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but let us dwell just a bit with China. <coughs> the world's largest solar power firm today is Suntech. It's Chinese. This year, the world's largest installer of solar capacity will be China. This year, the world's largest installer of wind capacity will be China. This year, the world's largest exporter of energy efficient technologies, that would be China. China is, for a number of reasons, going into this business of growing in a greener way. Uh, for many reasons, pollution challenges, economic challenges, 75% of, or something like it, of the Chinese stimulus packages have sort of been related to the green area. China is doing this. We heard in Hu Jintao's speech yesterday that they are setting a target for renewables of 15% by 2020. Uh, they are also now talking about emissions, intensity targets, and things like that. They start to acknowledge that they also have a responsibility in this field. Um, I don't know, just to give you one example, it is said that today China puts up one wind turbine every hour. That's sort of the dimension of, of what is happening there. They plan to become the world's leading producer of electric cars. They plan to install 200 million smart electricity meters in homes over the next five years. As Thomas Friedman wrote in his recent book, if we were China, not for two days, just for one. But I mean, when they decide to get it done, they really get it done. As I said, there are many reasons why they do this, but they are not alone. China is moving. Some of us have, in recent days, been pretty much with representatives from the Indian government. And publicly, India announced the, this Monday that now they are also taking actions. We all knew that, that they are doing this domestically. But they actually start also now to recognize that they must also sort of verify in front of the rest of us what are they doing and not only what are their plans, but what would be the mitigation outcome of these plans. I'm not going into any detail into that now, but just to say India is also leaving the rhetoric that you, the rich countries created the problems and we're just waiting for you to solve it. They start to say, yes, we know we will also have to be part of this equation. They are actually also moving now. For really quite some years, many countries have been hiding behind the fact that China and India was not really doing anything international in this field. Now they start to move. So needless to say, the pressure towards those who may not be moving that much still, that will increase. Can I just, before I, within long, will we'll finish this, just mention another example. We're often talking about India, China, the emerging economies. Now I mentioned that in my childhood we were dependent of imported oil from Saudi Arabia. I had the chance recently to speak to the Saudi Arabian oil minister, Mr. Naimi. He is now, today, he is at the inauguration of the 
big King Abdullah University in Jeddah, where they have established seven laboratories, where the solar laboratory will be the most modern in the world right now. Why? Because as I say, they know that they're going to diversify their economy. That's the only way they can sort of employ the young generation. And they have this vision that within only a few decades, exports of solar from the Saudi Arabia will be bigger than today the export of oil. I mean, as Bob Dylan said, the times are a changing. It's just to say that it's not just a question of China and India that's all important. It's all around the planet that things start moving. Now, I also mentioned this moral leadership that the United States uh, had in the 20th century by building legitimate international institutions like the UN and Bretton Woods and lots of other things. Could one imagine moral leadership in the 20th century without establishment of these institutions and cooperating with them? Would that not be a part of having this moral leadership? I believe yes. So what constitutes moral leadership in the 21st century? Well, first this is about leadership by example. There you can say that the 20th century was a showdown of military power, but the 21st century would be about who can create the most sustainable and resource efficient society. As we enter into the second decade of this century, the US can renew its moral leadership on the defining global issue of 21st century climate change by leading by example. And there I really have an appeal to my American friends to enact a carbon trade system, set renewable energy targets, and move forward with the legislation in the Senate. I'm absolutely sure that this will inspire the world. And then the co-benefit will be that the US will be set up for a low carbon growth. America must renew itself and lead once more, not by the example of its power, but by the power of its example. Creating global institutions, structures to contain climate change and to ensure that we minimize the hardship of those exposed to its consequences will also be essential to having this climate deal done in Copenhagen. That's actually what the conference is all about. And I'll end up just saying a few things about this global deal. As you know, the G8 leaders and the major economist forums leaders, the 17 biggest economists leaders, agreed this summer in Italy that we should strive to keep global temperature increase at a maximum of 2 degrees Celsius, that is 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. One thing is that we must do this because science tells us that it is essential. And we must also do it because, as I said, cost of inaction is much more expensive. Therefore, of course, developed countries must take the lead with deep cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. We must reduce by the middle of this century by 80% in order to have global reductions uh, in, the, in the magnitude of 50%. But it is equally important also to have ambitious midterm targets. It's not enough as a politician of today just to say what is going to happen 41 years from now. We must also start sort of having the pathway defined already. Both developed and developing countries act now to reach the goals set by the intergovernmental intergovernment, inter panel on climate change of peaking very, within some very few years and large developing countries, as I said, start to take a cleaner, greener path than industrialized nations did when we created our wells with technological and finance assistance from developed countries. But we must also provide assistance that enables vulnerable countries to adapt to the impact of climate change. We must boost capacity building and provide finance and technology for the vulnerable countries that are hit hardest and hit first. Therefore, Copenhagen must catalyze the transition to a global low carbon economy. That is basically what we must try to achieve this December. 
I know it's an enormous ambition, and I know that it's also the largest overhaul of the world economy since industrialization. But I also believe that there is an enormous potential. There are lots of wins. An ambitious deal will expand markets for clean technologies, and nations must grow in a sustainable manner, or we will have much higher increase in temperatures with catastrophic fo follows of that. Thus, and that's, this will be my final point, thus, this is not an anti-growth agenda. It is the opposite. It is the only kind of growth we can afford in the 21st century. If we don't do this, then it's going to turn out anti-growth. I also think that one of the very crucial benefits that will come with this focus is enhanced energy security. I recall on the, during your election campaign last September, Henry Kissinger wrote an article where he said, how wise is it to borrow all this money in China for to be able to pay them to different regimes in the Middle East? Maybe there is a wiser way of sort of gaining strategic leadership. Therefore, I believe that if we don't make the binding political commitment in Copenhagen this year, there is a risk that then we'll never make it, and then we can come back to that. But those who will suffer the most will probably be American business. Why is that? Because China is doing this anyhow. EU has decided for itself how we will do this, and we have split the burden among us. So if not American business has the driver of a political framework, a known political framework, with some binding commitments, then it will take longer time to make the transition and they will be the losers. Basically, I believe that this level playing field, we will never have it from one day to another. It takes time also to have the global price on carbon, but it will come through an international agreement. And we need that agreement, not only for the sake of climate, but also because a bottom-up approach will be much, much slower. And if we don't get the targets and the reductions, but just saying Copenhagen will do the easy parts, the adaptation part, technology maybe, then let's come back sometime next year or the year after to address the reductions. Then I have one question left. Where would you then have the finance from? The finance is going to stem from having a carbon market that could also generate billions into adaptation and technology. And that would be what incentivize business actually to make the innovation technology-wise that we need. So that is why we must have this agreement. We must have it done. We have been talking for many years. And I would also say, yes, it's complicated. Yes, it's difficult. But yes, it is also doable if we want to do it. There will be lots of elements to be dealt with later, lots of details. What it's about now is to have the political agreement. And just a final reflection. Those in America that says, it would be much better if we did it April, March maybe, not, not later because then there are midterm elections coming up. That's not, no good. I mean, it's not that easy to plan how the world will look like in March, April of 2010. Say that suddenly we're all stuck with some very, very big challenges in Afghanistan. Say that those economists who say that the, we have only seen the first bottom of the economic crisis, maybe there is a new to come. Maybe they were right. I mean, if we miss that opportunity, this window of opportunity that has been building up for many years, if we miss that now, we never know when we get a new chance. That is why I believe that we are very much dependent on the U.S. to be able to show leadership. We must be willing to engage in an international regime aimed at dealing with what has proved to be the central challenge of our cent century. Able to turn around its economy here in the United States and be ready to negotiate in Copenhagen. Nobody ever said it was easy. 
But something I have always admired about America is the mentality expressed in a quote by President then John F. Kennedy when he launched a central challenge for America in the 20th century going to the moon in less than 10 years. He said, we choose to go to the moon this decade and do those other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That is the spirit needed to sustain American leadership in the 21st century. Thank you.